Good afternoon and welcome to this webinar on Moving Forward Reflections on the Papal Visit. My name is Mark Hathaway. I am the Executive Director of the Jesuit Forum for Social Faith and Justice. And I welcome all of you uh, to this event. It's wonderful to see so many familiar faces in the middle of summer. Uh, wonderful that you've been able to join us. And I'd like to extend a special welcome to our guests today, Rosella Kenoshemeg and Harry Lafond, who will be sharing their reflections with us. Uh, after we have shared those reflections, we'll move into small groups to allow some time for reflection on your part. Uh, come back together after that to be uh, hearing those reflections and then some concluding words from Rosella and Harry. But before we go any further, I'd like to turn things over to my colleague, Trevor Scott, who will be sharing a land acknowledgement with us. The forum itself, we acknowledge the land we meet upon is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek peoples, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples in what is known, commonly known as Toronto, uh, traditionally, traditionally known as Tucker Toronto. And these people offered assistance to the European travelers to this territory um, and still continue to do so and sharing their knowledge for survival and what was oftentimes a harsh climate. And this area of Tekka Toronto is um, governed by the Dish With One Spoon Wampum, which is a covenant treaty between the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabek peoples to care for the lands around the Great Lakes. And we also acknowledge that this region is covered by the Williams Treaties from 1923 with the Chippewa of Lake Simcoe and the Mississaugas of the North Shore of Lake Ontario. And so we are mindful that we seek a new relationship with, with the original peoples of this land and upon all of our lands um, throughout what we know as, as uh, Canada and more broadly speaking, uh, Turtle Island relationships that are based on honor and, and deep respect for the land and for one another. Maybe just take a moment, just be mindful and to share if you would like in the chat, the traditional territory upon which you are joining us uh, this afternoon. Thank you, Trevor. You could also, if you'd like to share uh, anything about the treaties that govern the area where you are. We know that uh, we're all treaty peoples, uh, even where no formal treaty was made between settlers and indigenous peoples, there's always older treaties that govern the land. So just to be mindful that by being in these places, we're governed by those treaties and, uh, and we have important obligations uh, in those treaties, many of which we know historically we have not lived up to those of us who are settlers. Um, so just be mindful of that today. So I'm going to begin, I'm going to do a very brief introduction. I'm going to share my screen just to, uh, I think this is the right one. And on current slide. Okay, is everyone seeing? Uh, okay, it's actually not the right this from the beginning. Just to this here. Uh, sorry about that. I just need to redo that. There we go. So, once again, uh, welcome today to this event. Uh, we're de delighted to have uh, both Rosella and Harry with us today, who I'll be introducing more formally and just a few minutes, uh, but just to say that uh, it's wonderful to have both of them, uh, both very knowledgeable people, uh, both uh, with lots of experience in this area. We know that they, you know, they're speaking as indigenous people who are also members of the Catholic Church, uh, but we know there are also other voices, uh, and and uh, we're mindful of those as well today. Those voices outside of the Catholic Church, particularly of Indigenous peoples that we need to be listening to. Uh, 
But just to recall very, very briefly about the visit itself, uh, I think most of us know that uh, you know this visit was put together in a relatively short time. It took place between the 24th and 29th of July with Pope Francis visiting in Alberta, Quebec, and Nunavut. Uh, in Alberta, you know, especially the that first visit to uh, Makwashis, where the apology was delivered, was a key moment in that visit. Uh, that was the site of Hermeniskan Residential School. And uh, I think that perhaps was one of the key moments, probably the key moment of, of the visit in many ways. Uh, but there were other events as well. There was, uh, you know, a visit to Sacred Heart of First People's Church in Edmonton. There was a large mass at Commonwealth Stadium. There was the pilgrimage to uh, Lac Saint Jean, which was that's Lac Saint Anne, excuse me, which was being a traditional place of pilgrimage from time immemorial uh, for the First Peoples of this land. And then the time in Quebec, including time in Quebec City, also uh, at Saint Anne de Beaupré uh, Church. And finally, concluding uh, in Iqaluit, uh, and then the flight back to Rome. So just uh, not to go into details about that, but just to kind of recall some of that uh, in the visits. Uh, just a few very quick observations. Call from 170. I think someone has thanks. Uh, some some very quick uh, observations. I think you know many people remark on the sincerity of the Pope, the the way the words were were given, uh, the fact coming here on relatively short. Uh, notice in maybe not the best health conditions and uh, you know the kind of genuine kind of presence that he brought to the visit. Uh, there was some both uh, positive and negative comments about uh, the symbolism of the, him being uh, given the headdress at Makwashis. Uh, I heard Murray Sinclair gave, gave a very beautiful commentary on that just saying that he felt it was very heartfelt and uh, on the part of Chief Littlechild and how it was a real sign of generosity on the part of Chief Littlechild, Little uh, but more of an individual or personal gesture from him to the Pope. Uh, we know that there were you know, concerns raised about problems around the tickets, the logistics, who could get a ticket. It's difficult. Uh, many residential school survivors found it difficult to get tickets, but also in some events, even for the or even very elderly and uh, infirm survivors having difficulty getting seating, for instance. So those kind of logistical problems around the visit. Uh, there were voices talking about the mass in Edmonton, which seemed a bit kind of divorced in, to some extent from the central uh, reason for this trip around uh, delivering the apology. It didn't seem to really connect to the whole uh, question uh, anything around Indigenous peoples in Canada in terms of uh, no, in, no ceremonial elements, uh, not really much mention made in the Mass about uh, what this visit was about. Uh, in terms of the actual words of the apology, there were some uh, questions raised about it being an apology more for the actions of individuals or some uh, church groupings, institutions, rather than a more collective or institutional apology and the participation of the church as an institution as a whole and a project of colonization. Uh, initially, there was no mention made of uh, genocide. That didn't happen actually until the plane on the way back to Rome or of sexual abuse that came a bit later in the visit. Uh, no mention of the doctrine of discovery, which many had been hoping, I think, for. Uh, I heard questions about the amount of money being spent on the visit. Now, we know this visit was an actual uh, call from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, so it was important to do the visit. I don't think anyone doubts that, but 
the amount of money spent on the visit in contrast perhaps to the amount of money that uh, is, is still in the process of being raised for healing and reconciliation on the part of the Catholic Church. And some questions about whether uh, Pope Francis had been briefed properly, and if so, why didn't that happen? Uh, but I think you know all of these things, uh, you know, it's just to give some context, I think as well, a key question for us going forward is what are the next steps? Uh, and you know, where do we need to move now that this has happened, now that this important step has happened, where do we need to move? And you know what remains to be done, perhaps both in terms of what needs to be said, but probably even more so in terms of concrete actions, uh, I think would be a really important uh, question just, just to ask. So uh, that was just a very brief uh, kind of contextualization. Uh, over the course of this meeting, we're going to hear from both Rosella and uh, Harry at the beginning uh, to share their reflections. And then we're going to have some time to reflect in small groups ourselves on these questions and to come back. Uh, and I think particularly as we come back to reflect on that question of what are the next steps? What needs to happen at this point to move forward toward right relationship, uh, reconciliation, and decolonization. Uh, so I'd like to begin at this point then uh, to introduce our first guest for today, who is uh, Rosella Kanoshemeg, uh, who, as I mentioned, has served on the advisory committee for the Sneem to Indigenous Voices and uh, has been very uh, helpful and instrumental in terms of both the guide, but in many of our events as well. Uh, Rosella is Anishinaabe Kwi from the Gwimekong and Sita territory on Manitoulin Island. Uh, she's a retired registered nurse and a member of the Sault Ste. Marie Diocesan Order of Service. Uh, she also serves as a member at large on Our Lady of Guadalupe Circle and is one of the directors of the uh, Church's Indigenous Reconciliation Fund. Uh, so Rosella, I, I can only do this virtually, but I, I'd like to let me get <laughs> to offer you uh, this tobacco and uh, in gratitude for your being with us, for sharing your wisdom. And I open up this first question to you, which is really, uh, what do you feel has been the impact of the papal visit, particularly in terms of promoting healing and right relationships, both perhaps some of the more positive aspects, but also what were maybe some of the limitations or disappointments and the overall impact. So I'll hand it over to you, Rosella. Thank you so much for being with us. Bonjour, bonjour, Kenaguya. I have teamed my um, my presentation, Walking Together, Pilgrimage of Penance, to coincide with what the, what the Pope said. So I am grateful to the Jesuits for the opportunity to have gone to Edmonton and the two days prior to the Pope's visit. It was exciting to gather, to visit, share a meal, and to travel together. Even our Sault Ste. Marie Diocese Bishop joined us and he visited with everyone in our group. Now the impacts have been different for everybody that I spoke to. Listening to the prayers intercessions on Sunday at the Sacred Heart Church in Edmonton really touched me emotionally and brought out pleading tears for healing, reconciliation, and for acceptance of the apology. I had been asked to sit on the CCB Liturgical Planning Committee, where we developed some prayers, novenas, intercessions, litany of sorrows for the delegation visiting the Pope in Rome initially for December, which was postponed. Then we were developing an educational toolkit for the papal visit, and everything had to go up the ladder to be approved. 
And so I don't know if any of these were used or how they were used. One of the TRC's call to action was for Pope Francis to come to Canada, which he accepted on April 1st, 2022. He visited Edmonton and the dates were given by Mark. And supposedly with emphasis on indigenous participation. I say, supposedly, who defines and how is participation defined? Our pilgrimage, which began on Saturday at the Toronto airport, was with waiting as our flight was delayed by three hours, continued with starting our day on Monday at 3 a.m., walking a fair distance at the Moskwachis grounds. Eva on her crutches, and I managed to get a golf cart ride halfway to the gate. Again, her and I waited at the, as the volunteers had not arrived, and the police that were there were not able to help us as they did not know the sections that were that have been assigned. Someone did tell me to choose to sit anywhere in the center that was not marked. So when the group arrived at the gate, we moved in to take some seats, but we were told these were for people with green tags. We had yellow tags. We moved to the outer circle and again told the same thing. So when we moved up a little, we moved up to a little hill outside the circle that I call the margins under a tent in case it rained. The big screen and toilets were close by. Those are important things. The most exciting, exciting part was just seeing the people gathering and people who we have not seen for some time coming to find us. My sister found me. The event at Moskwa Cheese was the best day. They had a grand entry drumming, dancing, singing for this joy celebration and gift giving. A crying, hurting, hurting woman sang to the tune of O Canada, but not O Canada words. And I think the um, media announced, oh, she's singing O Canada in her language. No, those were not O Canada words. As I wandered to the outer circle to speak to someone, to get a selfie with Kreesan Ashkute, Ash a woman took me by the arm and guided me to go and sit inside the circle. Where I ended up sitting, I did not have a good view of the front stage or the big screen that was sideways and the sound was poor. I should have stayed in the margins. Later when I reviewed the translated speech online, I didn't miss much. Many people have said the apology for truth, justice, healing and reconciliation has been long overdue. Pope Francis repeated several times, I am sorry, I am deeply sorry. I humbly beg forgiveness, telling us in person of his sorrow and implore God's forgiveness, healing and reconciliation. He was given two pairs of moxins that symbolize sign of suffering by indigenous children and also spoke of a path to follow to journey walk and pray and work together to lead to justice healing and reconciliation pope francis said begging pardon is not the end of the matter it is the first step the beginning there was no mention of the doctrine of discovery in any of the speeches Genocide was not mentioned until Pope Francis was in the plane returning to Rome. There were mixed emotions for survivors. For some, especially the elders, there was some satisfaction, some experience they were happy to see and be in the presence of the Pope. Some feeling let down. Many had tears that were collected in paper bags given out to be burned in the sacred fire. I did not shed any tears. 
I felt a sense of calmness and peace from his speech. Many expressed anger, anger because of the gift of the headdress and by the woman who sang in tears and whatever word she spoke to the Pope in her language. In our Anishinaabe cultural teachings, we always give a small article, food or something that we treasure and which holds special meaning to visitors. Chief Wilton Little Child presented a headdress to the Pope to show respect and great honor. And the acceptance of the gift symbolizes the responsibility associated with it. He had sought approval from the other chiefs in the other area, in that area. The next day at the Commonwealth Stadium was quite different. All the clergy had upfront seating. The only indigenous participation were the three deacons who, who were assigned to sit on either side of the Pope and Deacon Gilbert from my home community who carried that heavy metal book up those stairs in the processional and who proclaimed the short gospel. There was no smudging ceremony in the liturgy. The only smudging, a do-it-yourself, was in the hallway as you entered the stadium. The mass was in Latin. The last verse in the recessional hymn was in was um, in an indigenous language, but sung by the main choir, not an indigenous group. The drummers who played in the entertain entertainment part long before the mass didn't have any in the liturgy. I was disappointed, very disappointed. We sat on the sun side of the stadium. I forgot my hat my sunblock. I had to climb down steps to get to the sixth row and then back up again. No elevators, penance. I heard from the Cadbury Native Ministry coordinator that at St. Anne de Beaupre, the indigenous elders wandered up and down the church aisles looking for a seat to sit in. No one offered their seat. Up front seats were reserved for clergy and dignitaries. The only indigenous participation was a group of three indigenous women who sang in their language at the offertory. Now the overall impact, there's still a lot of hurt, anger, blame, intergenerational trauma, and so a lot of work still remains to be done. Some elder survivors just like being in the presence of the Pope and they were happy. So that's my, uh, my reflections for that part of the question. Begrich, Rosella, thank you so much for those words and for your sharing. Uh, I'd now like to introduce on the same, speak on the same question, uh, Harry Lafon. Uh, Harry is a member of Muskeg Lake uh, Cree Nation in Saskatchewan, a deacon. Uh, he's also a member of the Jesuit Forum Management Committee. Uh, Harry is a former executive director of the Office of the Treaty Commissioner in Saskatchewan and has also served as both uh, chief and as a band counselor uh, of Muskeg Lake Cree Nation. Uh, Harry currently teaches Indigenous education at St. Thomas More College at the University of Saskatchewan. So, uh, Harry, I'd like to offer you as well this, uh, some, this tobacco as uh, in gratitude for your presence with us today and uh, welcome and uh, we're very happy to have you with us. Hey, you're muted, Harry. Yeah, just what? The guy that took the thumb scat now, a cake or the cape, a bit of I greet you all. I greet all of you. 
I come from the uh, Treaty 6 territory, just a short distance where the first signing of Treaty 6 occurred in 1876. And I've lived in my community uh, most of my uh, married life and raised my family here. And I, I'm growing old here uh, in, the, in the same house, in the same yard. Um, <clears throat> I guess my uh, when we talk about uh, impact, uh, uh, there's a number of things that uh, that come to mind. Uh, number one, uh, number one for me as uh, personally is the uh, uh, my expectations that uh, came out of uh, previous experiences, uh, especially working with the uh, with the Catholic Church over the over the course of my um, uh, of my life. Um, but most, most importantly, the uh, expectations that came out of my, my experience with Pope John Paul II in uh, 1997, uh, when I was fortunate enough to, uh, uh, to be invited to address the, uh, the Synod of America uh, uh, with, the, with the Catholic uh, bishops of, of Canada. Out of that experience, uh, I, I've, I've grown to expect a lot more uh, in the area of relationship development between indigenous people and, and, and the Catholic Church. And the, the agreement to have uh, to, uh, to host Pope Francis in Canada was certainly an, a very important part of, of a long process that we're trying to uh, trying to uh, uh, bring into being here in Canada, uh, and it, it's really important uh, to uh, to understand that that this is a this is a really long term uh, 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 process that we're talking about. It's taken us four hundred years to get here. Uh, and in the 400 years, there's been a lot of wrong, a lot of injustice, and a lot, a lot that should have happened differently. And so we're not going to change that in one visit, nor are we going to change it in one generation. But what is really important, I think, is that we have an opportunity to make a difference. But in order to do that, we have to take a look at all the players. And uh, and so, as I said at uh, Muskwachis, um, waiting expectantly like everybody else for the arrival uh, of the Pope, despite all the, uh, what do you call it, uh, all the hardships that uh, some of the people were experiencing that particular morning because it was cold, it was a little bit rainy, uh, and a lot of people came unprepared for uh, good Alberta uh, July weather. Anyway, uh, as I sat there, I, I, I spent quite a bit of the time just looking at people, watching, and uh, I, I paid particular attention to the bishops who were sitting there in a long row in their cassocks and looking very, uh, very Catholic in their, uh, in their presence. And I couldn't help but think, what is going through their minds? What are they hearing? You know, and how do they envision themselves uh, becoming part of the team here? Because really, I think uh, Pope Francis' uh, his challenge to all of us there was how do we find uh, the, the spirit to reach out to each other, engage with each other, and, uh, and develop an implementation here over the long term that our, our children and grandchildren are going to buy into and, and, and appreciate for uh, what it is in, in determining uh, that relationship, that uh, uh, much damaged relationship that uh, we have to contend with. And so I think, I think there was a lot of uh, a lot of things happening over the course of those four, uh, four times that the, the Pope uh, 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 was given an opportunity to, uh, to, to speak to the people. And uh, 
I, I wasn't able to attend Sacred Heart because I had to rehearse how to stand quietly beside the Pope uh, during the Mass. Uh, but my wife went to uh, Sacred Heart and she felt coming out of there that probably one of the uh, 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 one of the best moments in terms of the Pope connecting with people, uh, the, the attention he paid to the old people uh, and, and trying to uh, reach out to them to, uh, to get a sense of, uh, of, their, of their place in, uh, in, in our families and in our societies and, and in our country. And, um, and he carried that with him to, uh, to his talks at, uh, at, the, at the stadium and then again at uh, Lac St. Anne and then again at, uh, at St. Anne de Beaupre. So uh, Lac St. Anne was, uh, was really a different type of a gathering. Uh, the, the people there were there on a pilgrimage. They were there to, to pray and they waited patiently for the Pope to arrive. Uh, they had a program uh, and, and they celebrated indigenous culture, indigenous spirituality and, and the way that uh, the Dene people uh, can, uh, can, do, uh, uh, can do with their drums uh, and the singing and, and a mixture of uh, English and uh, and indigenous uh, voices. Now, in terms of limitations and disappointments, well, I, I, I echo what uh, Rosella uh, said about that. I felt at the end of these uh, four events, I felt there was, a, there was something missing. There was something missing. And over the course of the, uh, 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 of the days following that and thinking about it and trying to assess, you know, where did that feeling come from? I felt that there was an overwhelming protection for the, for the Pope. He was surrounded and, and, and those people who surrounded him created barriers that he could not, uh, because of his, uh, uh, of his uh, weakened condition, could not uh, command uh, a breakthrough. A and it's really, it, I think was, that was the, really the unfortunate part of this whole visit. Because my expectation going back to 1997 was, has always been, there needs to be a time where our elders, our spiritual leaders can sit down with somebody like the Pope and be able to, and be able to have an honest to God conversation about God, about the prayer, about spirituality. And there's absolutely no opportunity given during those, uh, during the, uh, the whole visit. Uh, I, I, I've been involved with the Catholic Church for all of my life. And one of the, one of the most uh, engaging and uh, inviting and welcoming gesture we make as indigenous people is to help is, is to help clergy understand who we are, what we come from, and what we have to offer the Catholic Church. Uh, at Saint Laurent, every year we celebrate Mass with a pipe ceremony and the Eucharist, and and that is our way of of reaching out to the. Uh, uh, to all our neighbors and especially the clergy, clergy to understand that the, the, the capacity for us to pray together is, uh, is there and it's, uh, it's for us to discover and it's for us to uh, support and affirm each other, not, not as in the past 400 years where one passes judgment on the other uh, without uh, without really knowing what they're passing judgment on. Uh, it's a, and that's the part that we have to reset. We are a people rich in, in, in a spiritual sense of who we are as, as individuals, as families, as communities, as praying people. And, and the future can only be built on, on a recognition of that gift to uh, uh, to the Catholic Church.
And so that in terms of um, limitation disappointments, that mass at, uh, at, um, in Edmonton at the stadium, it could have been so rich. It could have been all they needed to do was approach us and get us involved in setting the, uh, uh, setting the liturgy together. But instead of doing that, they did it the status quo, uh, leave it to the priests, leave it to the monsignors. And what do you end up? You end up with a mass in Latin, which has been extinct for, uh, for what, four or 50 years. Uh, and um, and, we, and uh, the, the three deacons are showpieces. And, and that's, that's the uh, indigenous content. It's very, uh, I think it's a, uh, it was a very um, uh, short-sighted uh, strategy to, uh, uh, to, that, uh, to that opportunity. So those are, those are my reflections at this point. I'll probably have more as, uh, as uh, I mull over the, those events. It was a lot to mull over, you know, over those four events that, that occurred in uh, Edmonton. So thank you. Thank you so much, Harry. That was a really deep and interesting reflection. Uh, so on the, the second round, I'm going to uh, invite Rosella once again to speak on the second question is, you know, what are the next steps both for the Catholic Church, perhaps as well for governments in terms of writing relationships, reconciliation, decolonization, but also perhaps what concretely can uh, can each of us, those of us who are who are not indigenous, uh, do to uh, live out this apology uh, and even beyond this apology uh, with actions. Like, how do we? Con what are some ways that we can concretely move forward toward uh, right relationship, decolonization, and justice? So, Rizella. I think she's muted again. There. Okay, now what did I say? <laughs> yes, now. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm going to touch on some points that are important to me um, that I feel um, should be shared with other people. But So I will begin, first of all, with... Um, description of reconciliation. It, it means to bring people back together. And in our language, we say, nos, nos co de do win, nos co de do win, uh, which is an Ojibwe word or maybe Odawa word. And, and it's with the use of elder wisdom and indigenous sacred approaches to a peaceful harmony and respectful relationship through commitment and repair of trust, not by words, but by action. So I said, I cannot dictate what the next step should be for the Catholic Church or for the government. But I can say that writing relationships, reconciliation and decolonization, even, even among the indigenous people has to happen and that there are requisites for improving relationships. And these are mutual recognition, mutual respect, and shared responsibility. Respecting the sacredness of all life. Strive to maintain harmony and peaceful coexistence with all peoples. Partnerships and walking hand in hand love, understanding, and sincerity, trust, deep listening, self-reflexive, I can't pronounce that word, reflexivity, creating space and being in action. Now we have our indigenous ways of healing and our teachings. And there was one teaching that was shared by elders and that was how to discover a special pathway and the power 
that leads to achieving balance and healing in our life. The most exciting thing is that we do not have to look very far to find the many gifts given to us, using them as medicine. We only need to look at inside of us and we can begin to live a way of life that is healthy for the body, mind, and spirit. This is the holistic approach and spirituality. This approach and spirituality are the starting points to learn about this special pathway. I believe that we can find our answers in our traditional teachings, especially in the medicine wheel and the seven grandfather teachings or the seven sacred teachings. Now, uh, we had a presentation done at our, local, um, our tertiary hospital a few months ago, and it was by Dr. Brenda Restul, and she gave the following. She gave those seven grandfather teachings respect to be present in dialogue and learning. Truth. Be truthful with yourself and in your sharing. Honesty. Share and listen without judgment or blame. Bravery. Be open to change. Wisdom. Engage in inner, inner reflection and welcome other reflections. Love. Pay attention to what has heart and meaning. Humility. Make commitment to self-evaluation and healing ceremonies. Learn what we mean when we say culturally appropriate. And we can look at awareness, cultural awareness, which, which is the acknowledgement of difference, sensitivity, recognition of the importance of respecting differences, competence, focus on skills, knowledge, attitudes. So to practice in a manner that is culturally safe to ensure the individual feels safe and respected. Safety involves self-reflection and understanding cultural values and norms of indigenous individual that are different due to unique socio-political histories. Indigenous worldviews, impact of colonization, concepts of health and healing. The individual is to be respected and empowered, culture and knowledge acknowledged. She also spoke about cultural humility. And she said that it's a lifelong commitment to self-evaluation and self-critique to readjust the power imbalances in relationship dynamics and to developing mutually beneficial and non paternalistic advocacy partnerships with communities on behalf of individual and defined populations. So some of the things you may want to look into more that are mentioned by the TRC is to look at Aboriginal health issues, history and legacy of residential schools, the United Nations Dec Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, Treaties and Aboriginal Rights, Indigenous Teachings and Practices, Intercultural Competency, Conflict Resolution, Human Rights, Anti-Racism and Systemic Racism. And if you would like to learn more, you are encouraged to seek out other information, such as reading the calls to action, visiting a friendship center, reading books by Indigenous authors, take a course or a workshop on Indigenous people's history and culture, such as listening to Indigenous voices, Kairos blanket exercise, form a group within your work team to talk about Indigenous issues, participate in events such as Walk for Reconciliation, and National Indigenous Day activities, such as the Orange Shirt Day. Respecting Indigenous people's right to self-determination in spiritual matters 
including the right to practice, develop, <clears throat> and teach their own spiritual and religious traditions and customs and ceremonies consistent with Article 12-1 of the United Nations Declarations of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. It is important to note that Indigenous peoples need allies and not people to tell them what to do or to direct and benefit from Indigenous issues and challenges. We need to work together and support each other to make a place where all people are valued and included. Reconciliation is a very personal journey and one in which all Canadians must play a part. There is hope for the future for healing. We cannot change the past, but we must look at our past of hurts to deal with where we are now, face the future and look at all the possibilities the door has been open. And I would like to share a poem that I did back in 2017. Ac ac accept me for who I am. Acknowledge that I am sacred, precious, special gift from the creator. Respect my beliefs my traditions, my culture, and my language. Respect my sacred ceremonies and sacred objects. Respect my spirituality, the key to deeper connection with the creator. Listen to my old long stories of wisdom and love. Listen with your eyes, your ears, and your heart. Let us move forward with safety overlooking the negative. Let us use the gift of our voice to talk and to communicate. Let us commit to making effort to walk together. Let us heal our relationship. Let us open doors of opportunities for future generations. And that's um, and that's the part I I have for your question. I hope I answered it. Miigwech. Miigwech, Rosella. Thank you very much. And now uh, we'll have Harry will also be speaking to the same question about next steps. Thank you, Rosella. And I, I'm I think uh, I'm just. I'm just going to uh, speak uh, as a uh, uh, using your thoughts as, uh, as as a base from which to uh, to address the questions of uh, what are the next steps uh, I, I I appreciate very greatly the um, uh, the way you've laid it out and uh, identified uh, the key elements of, uh, of reconciliation so thank you for that and so when I when I think about you know uh, what are the next steps, well, uh, it's like any I think any community development project that I've been involved in. It all begins at home. It all begins with uh, a personal commitment, a personal uh, 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 what do you call it? Uh, a personal assessment of uh, of. Uh, talent and who we uh, who I am and how I can contribute to uh, to the big picture and uh, this is no different it's what can I do what can I do as an individual and how can I then uh, impact uh, my family uh, my community and uh, and then the, uh, the circle sort of uh, continues to expand from there uh, I've been I've been involved consistently over the last 20 years uh, in my community, uh, trying to help uh, people to uh, to uh, to understand treaty, to understand community, to understand the need for uh, rebuilding family, uh, discovering the Cree foundations of 
of uh, of who we are as a as a pe uh, as a people, and what are the teachings that we think we have forgotten, but not haven't really. We just have not uh, had an opportunity to uh, kind of stir the pot and, and and allow those teachings to rise to the top. Uh, that's the kind of work I've been involved in, and so. With, uh, with this visit, it had, that, that hasn't changed. That commitment hasn't changed. Uh, I, I see this all fitting together as, uh, as one large project. What I, what I am looking out for is what is the response for some of the, some of the decision makers inside of the, of the structural Catholic Church? I, I'm not talking about the, the people themselves. I'm talking about the... Uh, the, the hierarchy of uh, uh, of uh, bishops and archbishops and cardinals and, and clergy. Um, <clears throat> there, I think there is a challenge out there for, for change to occur at those levels. And, uh, and so I'm looking for, uh, I will be looking for signs as to uh, steps being taken inside of those uh, those groups to that they really heard uh, they really heard the challenge of uh, of changing that the relationship uh, with the indigenous people in Canada. Uh, for example, uh, the uh, bishops uh, assembly is coming up in October. I am waiting to see what's on the agenda. And what importance is uh, reconciliation given in that in that agenda, and how does it uh, map itself out as a, as a plan creating uh, process? It'll be interesting to uh, uh, to see where the bishops take uh, what steps they take initially uh, after awesome. hearing all awesome. those messages. Um, The, uh, the, the, our neighbors, uh, Muskeg is a little parish community and we have neighbors. We have, uh, we have parishes that are within five, 10 minutes of where we are. Um, the new, uh, the resetting of a relationship has to include those people. There has to be a continued effort made to educate each other. It's not just a question of indigenous people educating, uh, educating and providing opportunity for engagement to occur, but it has to go the other way around as well. Uh, we have to, as indigenous people, uh, have to uh, uh, have to learn how to move from the uh, from the trauma we've we've experienced and and the uh, uh limitate that limitation that has put on us as individuals and as uh, as communities uh, we need to learn how to uh, to live out treaty the treaty that we signed with uh, with canada with the people of canada and it says on there to live in harmony with and so it's simple words but they are, it's a very demanding, uh, uh, a very demanding commitment uh, in, that, in that covenant agreement between, uh, between peoples. And so I think uh, as we go forward, those are the sorts of things that uh, we're going to have to uh, revisit and, and learn to, uh, learn to, allow information to go back and forth between cultures, uh, between parishes, and, and uh, see, uh, see what we have to offer each other and where, we, where their common ground is. Where is the common ground? Let's, let's look for it, let's find it, and let's build from that common ground. Uh, and I think, uh, I think we've done Quite well in some in some jurisdictions and uh, other jurisdictions it, 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 uh, it, it's gone down a different path and so um, uh, we have a, a major generational uh, plan that we have to put together here to uh, uh, to, uh, to 
have a church that uh, that reflects what Jesus Christ uh, uh, taught us to fundamentally is uh, the the need to love each other, to love ourselves, and to love each other. And uh, but it's a tall order when it comes to actual uh, living it out. So those are my thoughts on. Uh, uh, on the future and uh, and where we need to go. Thank you so much, Sherry. It was great to hear. Thanks to all for sharing your reflections from your small groups. At this point, I'd like to give uh, Harry and Rosella a chance to share some concluding words with us. So we'll begin this time with Harry. Uh, so Harry, uh, it's over to you. Uh, I want to thank everybody who's uh, uh, shared their thoughts and, uh, and, and very forthright and uh, uh, from the heart uh, comments and, and observations and analysis. And I think uh, I think what I see going forward, I think. Pope Francis has shown some, some more, some more of a genius in trying to get indigenous, uh, trying to get the uh, parishioners to voice their uh, uh, their their participation and their analysis of their own church and their own uh, parishes and their own communities through the synodal process, and it's really, uh, I think, it really. Uh, we need to we need to grasp that process and make it work for us because uh, I think it's one of those uh, I uh, one of those items that uh, can go can go either way uh, and if we if we like being heard then we should be pushing our our parishes and our dioceses to to uh, make that cultural shift. So that consultation really does occur between uh, parishioners and and the uh, the leadership of their uh, uh, of their uh, jurisdictional areas. Uh, that's one that's one thought. And then, by the way, that that is a very indigenous process. Uh, I've lived in in indigenous communities all my life, and, and consultation is really it's real, and and leadership. Uh, traditional leadership in the in, in most of our cultures is based on uh, on uh, listening to the voice of the people uh, who are not afraid to uh, to stand up and say this is the way the world should move uh, and uh, you as our leaders need to serve your community from that perspective so it's a it's a, it's not a it's not a far far cry for us because we operate that way already. Um, just on a final note, I, I mean, I, 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 there are a lot of criticisms out there and very diverse uh, opinions. But personally speaking, I find um, anything we can hang our hats on as being uh, a positive movement towards a future, uh, I think we should maximize our effort to uh, to recognize and and make it work for us um, the way I look at it this is this is not an event uh, Pope Francis coming here was not an event it was a pilgrimage and we need to take it as such and a pilgrimage is is sometimes it's a way of changing the inside of us, our spirits. We go on a pilgrimage, we go on a long walk, we go, you know, uh, and so it's a cultural shift that we're, uh, that uh, I think uh, Pope Francis is trying to point us towards. Uh, and as Canadians, as Catholics, we need to look at that. And as far as the doctrine of discovery, uh, um, we, uh, I, I live it every day in Muskeg Lake. The doctrine of discovery is, is that oppressive uh, way the government treats us, uh, the Indian Act and all the policies that they have and all the, 
useless reporting that they require us because they're they're uh, they're giving us money that they think belongs to them. You know, it's that's the doctrine of discovery, and uh, we need to unpack it. You know, and, and uh, Trudeau and all these people that continue to uh, operate this way, we've got to impact them. And we can only do that from, from our parishes, from our communities, and from our own uh, study and understanding of what that doctrine of discovery really means in terms of uh, being embedded in our whole, uh, our whole culture and our whole way of doing things and whole way of being in Canada. Thanks so much, Sherry. That's that's very helpful. Uh, so, uh, on to Rosella. Let's make sure I'm unmuted. I just want to say thank you to everybody who has um, sh uh, shared what they thought. Um, I think we had good discussions and um, and I wanted to say um, something that, that happened. Uh, there was a letter written by Frederick, I think it was. It was written in French. I tried to read it, but I, I don't speak French. I can pick out the odd word here and there. But you know, my my computer did magic. It translated it into English for me. So thank you. <laughs> thank you for your comments and your concerns. And uh, and uh, I was speaking to somebody who was at the uh, Congress there in Midland. Uh, he speaks Spanish. And he said what the Pope said was authentic. He was very pleased with what the Pope said. He said, because in the translation, you cannot translate literally, I guess, into English, uh, what he said in Spanish. So he, he felt good about what the, what the Pope had said. Yeah, and I think that, um, yeah, a lot of things that were shared, it's good. I think we have to begin somewhere. Um, and I have to say that uh, somebody who noticed the um, the liturgy at Midland um, on that Sunday, I felt at home, very much at home with that. It was very different from attending that Latin mass, you know because that's what one foreign language that we we heard but never knew what was being said and so we ha we have to understand what how we pray and i know it's important for me to pray in my own language because i know and i understand it and to build um, relationships by by maybe getting involved, not being afraid. And um, somebody said, they talked about St. Anne's Parish in, in Toronto. John Robinson used to be the, the man who did the, the smudging there, but he died, um, I think, about a month ago. So he's no longer there. I knew John. Um, and he did, he did good to, to share with other people. And I think that's, that's good when we want to share. We want to share, you know, um, so that you understand. That's where I come from. I share so that other people will understand. It's just not saying, oh, that's pagan, you know. That's not pagan. We were very spiritual people to begin with. Very spiritual. And our people say, That's what, that was a, how that was explained. Very, very spiritual people. So you can't say pagan. No way. You know, 
So we need to educate, yes, educate people, and um, and uh, that respect should be there. That's the most important part is respecting. If you don't respect, then you're not respecting the creator. That's one of our teachings. So thank you for all the sharings and um, too bad we didn't get to uh, everybody's, but uh, you have shared in your small groups and I think that is good enough. Uh, maybe we'll have another chance at some other time, other places. Jimmy Gwetch. Jimmy Gwetch, Rosella, and Jimmy Gwetch once again to Harry for sharing those reflections with us. And thanks to everyone who's come out today to listen and also to share your reflections. Uh, once again, I think there's been a lot of good ideas, a lot of uh, important reflections shared. So I thank you all for coming, uh, for taking part, for participating. And I wish you all a very happy remainder of the summer. Hope you can come out to future Jesuit Forum events as well. Thank you.